Talks presentation through the ANA e Learning Academy or a uh, numismatic dinner theater as uh, <laughs> at this time. Thanks for joining us so late in the day. Uh, recently, we've added many new e learning opportunities to our website, money.org. Uh, if you have not checked out uh, our website in the last month or so, please jump on, see some of the other new presentations uh, that are upcoming and uh, some of the ones that we've uh, added in our archives. You can access it right on the homepage of money.org big slider going right across the home page there. So during this presentation, you might come up with questions. If you do, please use the chat or the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen to send in your question, as all of our attendees are muted during this presentation. Your question will come to me and I will share the questions with our presenter at the end. If at the end of the presentation, we're unable to get to all the questions, I will send them to our presenter to answer. Toward the end of the presentation, I will be sending out a survey using the poll feature here in Zoom. Please answer each question honestly so that we can improve our presentations. The surveys will be shared anonymously with the presenter so that he too can improve if needed. So now I would like to introduce you to our presenter for the day, Jack E. Topping. He's gonna to be giving a money talk titled, Rushing Through Panama, a story of numismatics on the journey to the American gold rush. Now, using primary sources and other relevant information, this presentation focuses on the intricate nature of numismatics during the American Gold Rush, a watershed moment in U.S. history often overlooked by what came after miners arrived in 1850s California. The coins and currencies used during this westward journey will be discussed. Our presenter, Jack E. Topping, is the editor of Jet Numismatics website, and the host of the Jet Numismatics podcast. He has published numismatic content for thousands of viewers located in 49 countries for almost five years. His guest commentary, Numismatic Jewelry, Is It a Form of Self-Expression or Coin Mutilation? was published in Coin World in 2017, and he is followed by various industry leaders on social media. A New Jersey native, Jack is currently a college student and a proud member of the ANA since 2015. So without further delay, Jack, whenever you're ready, sir, the floor is yours. Take it away. Thank you, Sam. I appreciate it. I hope everyone is having a good evening. It's currently 7.33 here on the East Coast here in New Jersey. I know it's about 5.33 mountain time. I wanted to thank you all for, for joining me tonight. I gave a previous uh, Sunman lecture last week. Hopefully some of you were there to uh, experience an awesome presentation. If you did not, I, uh, I encourage you watch that and all the other Sunman lectures and Money Talks recordings um, after all are complete and on the ANA website. I did want to point out um, one thing that Sam mentioned, and that would be, well, two things actually, before we get started. Uh, the title, which I thought was pretty creative, Rushing Through Panama. Obviously, we're talking about the gold rush, so that's the first meaning of rushing. Second, rushing, because as we're going to learn in some of the chapters tonight of this, of this presentation, the people that were in Panama, the travelers, weren't exactly wanting to stay there for too long. So in essence, they were literally rushing through Panama on the way to the gold rush. So I just thought I would explain the, the title, if you will. And so let's go ahead and get started. As you know, my name is Jack Topping. Thank you, Sam, for the introduction. I am honored to be here and I'm truly excited to share this really interesting story with all of you. I wanna go over the breakdown of the presentation. Like I said, if you're here for the previous one last week, the, term, the layout in terms of chapters is the same. So I break my presentations down into chapters so it's a little bit easier to understand for the viewers. So it's not just all one big compilation of facts and information. It's a little bit easier to understand and, and break down. So the first chapter is gonna be talking about the background of the gold rush for those of you who may not know or, or want to learn more about the gold rush we're gonna go briefly into 
the background. The second is going to be a short chapter about the overland journey. So the three different routes that the travelers took to get to California. And we're going to be foc focusing mainly on, oh, well, exclusively on American travelers heading to California. So like I said, chapter one is going to be the background. Chapter two is going to be a very short chapter on the overland journey. Chapter three is going to be a lot of fun. That's the Panama journey. We're going to talk more mostly about numismatics, of course, but we're going to talk about um, some of the specifics involved. And then, of course, chapter four is going to be the South America journey going all the way down and around South America and then back up to California. And like, uh, like Sam said, um, I'll take any questions, comments, thoughts that you may have at the end. I'm going to try to aim to have 15 minutes of time for that to answer any questions or just have a discussion about the presentation. So before I begin chapter one, I do want to stress the importance of primary sources, like I mentioned in the, the introduction uh, that Sam read, and then we were talking about if you were here before uh, we got started. Primary sources are going to be absolutely crucial to this presentation, and I stress primary sources very much. And primary sources, I mean by actual writing from the travelers themselves. It's not secondhand information. It's something that the travelers that we're going to be talking about wrote themselves or published themselves in some way. So this way, meaning primary, it was them. We're hearing from them. In this case, we're going to talk. Excuse me. We're going to talk about four specific individuals, and it highlights a broader story of numismatics on the journey to California rather just than just a, a montage of the travelers. So using the writings of the travelers that we're gonna be talking about, specifically four, we're gonna be talking about the prices of goods, currencies used in particular, we're gonna talk mostly about coins, and then other stories that relate to that in some way. It's not necessarily going to be um, a slideshow of seated liberty coins or just a reflection of the traveler's life's life. It's not going to be a history lesson either on, you know, they were born on this day, they died on this day, except for, for one that we'll see. But we're going to be really focusing on numismatics, okay? And so the travelers that we're going to be talking about in the first trap chapter, excuse me, chapter one, we're going to be talking about Mr. Richard Henry Dana Jr. Chapter two is going to be about Mr. John Carr. It's going to be a very short chapter. I'm letting you know now, and I'll explain that at the end of the, the presentation. Chapter three, you might recognize the last name. We'll get to that. That's William Jones Topping. And then chapter four, it's going to be about Mr. George D. Dornan, okay? And we're going to hear from James Marshall, the person who actually discovered the gold in California that caused this whole event, this whole event that we're talking about today. We're going to hear from him, his writings rather. And we're going to hear from another traveler by the name of Bayard Taylor. I want to make sure I'm pronouncing that right. Bayard Taylor. And that'll be in chapter three. So with that being said, the, pr the primary resource available is actually a compilation of primary sources. So when I say primary resource to me in terms of research, it's going to be this book. It's mirrored, but it's called Gold Rush, an American, I'm um, excuse me, Gold Rush, a literary exploration. It's all about uh, travelers, some of them American, some of them from other countries. And that is edited by Mr. Michael Kowalewski. And I might, I forgive me if I'm pronouncing his name right, uh, incorrect rather, Kowalewski. We're going to be talking about that book that he edited. So like I said, it's going to be a compilation of primary sources in that book. Him and his team who with the California Council of the Humanities and his entire research team did a fantastic job on compiling these resources, so much so that we're using that book mostly for this talk. And I want to get to it. I'm just trying to give you some idea of how this is structured. So for us, this is a gold mine, pun intended, looking both at the American gold rush story, but we find golden nuggets, pun intended as well, about numismatics in these primary source writings here and there. So without further ado, let's get into chapter one. We're talking about the background. Our featured traveler in this, in this chapter is Richard Henry Dana Jr. Now he actually was not a 49er as many people call him. He did not move to California 
for the gold rush. He actually moved, and I, excuse me, this is a, a typo here. It was 1834 that he went to California. He made an arduous journey of himself, arduous journey himself, excuse me. But this time, this is way before the other three travelers that we're going to talk about. Like I said, 1834. So almost 15 years or so before even the gold rush. Dana Jr. kept a personal record, a personal journal of his travel to California, 1834, like I said, which was published as a book called Two Years Before the Mast. And like I said, these are going to be books or, or publications, snippets of included in this compilation. So there's no confusion. Like I said, snippets are included in the, in the Gold Rush book that we're citing in this presentation. We learned from Kowalewski, again, forgive me if I'm pronouncing his name wrong, is introducing Dana Jr.'s story that Dana Jr. left Harvard University in Boston and headed to California in 1834. He did this, the route he took, was the South America route that we're gonna talk about shortly. He took the South America route from Boston, Massachusetts, all the way around South America, and then back up to the other side of the country on the Pacific in California. So let's take a look at what Dana Jr. actually writes about his experience. We're gonna focus on what he says in terms of numismatics. If you're interested in learning more about his story, I, again, I recommend you, you read a gold excuse me, Gold Rush, A Literary Exploration. I recommend you read that book for his story and any other story that we're going to talk about tonight. Dana Jr. on page seven of this compilation book writes, quote, the country abounds in grapes, yet they, the California people, buy bad wine made in Boston and brought round to us at an immense price and retail it amongst themselves at a real by the small wine glass. Their hides too, which they value at $2 in money, they give for something which costs 75 cents in Boston, end quote. Further adding at the end of the paragraph, quote, things sell on average at an advance of nearly 300% upon the Boston prices, end quote. So Dana Jr. gives us numismatist listening, a great piece of information to work with. We learned from the quoted three sentences that that wine was, rather uneconomically imported versus grown and made locally. As those of you who enjoy wine may very well know that Californian wine is a big deal. But back then, at least in 1834 from Dana Jr., it was imported from Boston. And the wine was at a ridiculous price at the time, likely due to high transportation costs and very importantly, excuse me, very importantly, we learn that Dana Jr. refers to prices in the California marketplace in both reals and U.S. dollars. And for those of you who don't know, both Spain and Mexico, Mexico being an independent country, issued silver currency or coinage in the form of reals. That was, that was the name commonly referred to as Spanish dollars or Mexican dollars, if you will. And since Dana Jr. is in the Mexican colony of California at the time, it should not be a surprise that both currencies are used, but it highlights our first instance of numismatics pre-California gold rush. So it sets the stage that numismatics, in this sense, is already there 15 years or so before we really start talking about the migration of people because of this precious metal. And I want to reiterate a point in the quote, Dana Jr., I believe Kowalewski added this afterwards, but it does say, quote, a real in parentheses was 12 and a half cents, end quote. So we not only have the coin that was used, a real, but we have, thanks to Kowalewski, and we're going to talk about this in chapter three, we have a bit of a conversion. So we can understand the conversion exists even though we're talking about two different currencies and it's not exactly easy to find that information necessarily. You can't just Google it and, and expect to have a perfect answer. Here we, ha we hear from the expert, the person on the ground and the editor that it is 12 and a half cents. And we're gonna confirm that and verify that in chapter three. So like I said, it gives us a great description of his numismatic experiences in California 15 years before the vast amount of travelers arrived. 
We also hear from Dana Jr. in this quote, how the prices of goods in general were woefully increased compared to Boston prices. This from Dana Jr. points out that even in 1834, we know that people were just as angry and aggrieved by the prices of products as we are today, 186 years later, while we have the ability to reach out to companies and complain and, and let our voice be heard, Dana Jr. did not exactly have that liberty across the country. He had to go all the way around another continent to get to his destination, and so did likely his product, or in this case, the Californian's product, wine from Boston. So he, his mention of less than desirable small quantity wine like, I, like he said, it was a small glass of wine for the cost of a real. It was less than desirable in both quantity and quality. It became a remnant of him telling a story than it was anything else. So he included it because he thought it was important to mention in his journal. And that's going to be important to talk about later as we, we go on. So if we move to the end of Dana Jr.'s snippet on page nine, we hear from Dana Jr.'s perspective how rudimentary the bartering system was for the people of California at that time. Just 15 years, like I said, before the migrants came in for the gold rush. Dana Jr. says on page nine, quote, another thing that surprised me was the quantity of silver that was in circulation. I certainly never saw so much silver at one time in my life. As during that week that we were at Monterey, end quote. Further adding in his next sentence, quote, they have no circulating medium but silver and hides, which the sailors call California banknotes, end quote. So we just heard from Dana Jr., California, a decade and a half or so before the gold miners came in, California ran on silver, not gold, like we know after the fact, after the gold rush, we know all about the gold that came from the gold rush, but even before that, California ran on silver, and like the sailors, which Jada Jr. mentions, ran on California banknotes, which were hides. So that being said, let's talk about the actual discovery. We're going to take a quick look at James Marshall's writing. Now, James Marshall was the man who started this entire chain reaction, an incredible movement of people who wanted to have their share of Californian gold. The snippet of the account we're referencing now, which was first published in 1891, is also featured, like I said, in Gold Rush, A Literary Exploration. And again, we're going to use this book many times throughout the presentation. The editor, Kowalewski, in introducing Marshall's writings, explains that Marshall was working for a mill owner named John Sutter. Many of you who are involved in American history from this time period will know who John Sutter is. He was in Coloma, California. So if we go to Marshall's actuals writing, actual writings, we learn in the first few paragraphs that he was doing his normal job and something caught his eye. Marshall on page 48 of Gold Rush Literary Exploration, as we can see right here, he writes in his book titled Marshall's, in his publication titled Marshall's Own Account of the Gold Discovery, writes, quote, my eye was caught with the glimpse of something shining in the bottom of the ditch. There was about a foot of water running then. I reached my hand down and picked it up. It made my heart thump, for I was certain it was gold." End quote. So we all know that it was indeed gold that he found, obviously the American gold rush. But what was Marshall's opinion on keeping that secret? He addresses this on page 49 of the compilation book edited by Kowalewski saying, quote, we thought it our best policy to keep it as quiet as possible till we should have finished our mill. But there was a great number of disbanded Mormon soldiers in and about the fort. And when they came to hear of it, why it just spread like wildfire and soon the whole country was in a bustle, end quote. So we see that Marshall indeed inadvertently kick us, kickstart a huge chain reaction. He wanted to keep it secret, but like we can see right here, failed and was instrumental in many people leaving their lives, their old lives, to come and mine for gold in California thanks to his discovery. So now that we know what it was like before the discovery and the story of the discovery, let's introduce 
our second traveler starting with chapter two, the Overland Journey. Now, like I said, this is gonna be a very short chapter and we'll discuss why after we get through the other travelers. So again, we're gonna reference a gold, gold Rush, a literary exploration. I keep saying a gold rush. The title is Gold Rush, a literary exploration. Like I mentioned quickly, it's very sparse in references to numismatics on this particular journey as compared to some of the other travelers. But the overland route is where we hear from John Carr. And this route was particularly difficult to find information on, at least in terms of the readings and writings compiled in Kowalewski's compilation book. But we learn about John Carr from him on the overland route passing through Mormon territory. And this, although not part of learning about numismatics on the particular journey, is interesting to note as it is, at his, excuse me, as it is a, tied into another major facet of the overland journey, and it's a unique story. And that unique facet, other than talking about John Carr, is that the Mormon population in the greater, greater modern-day Utah, rather, area and beyond is where we're going to be talking about. And that's where John Carr is. He's in Salt Lake City at this point. So despite the overland route being a little sparse in terms of numismatics data, we learned from Carr that he was offered U.S. dollars in exchange for working for individuals associated with the Mormon faith, saying on page 124 of the compilation book by Kowalewski, edited by Kowalewski, he says, quote, he then proposed to me to stay at Salt Lake and he would give me employment until fall at $5 per day. And if we liked each other, he would then start me in business, end quote. So again, it references U.S. dollars. And in later chapters, we're going to go into why I think records are so sparse as in terms of what did people do on the journey? Was there an exchange of money going on? at least in 1849 or 1848 or that era, that we can see references a specific currency. In this case, we hear from John Carr, who mentions specifically dollars. And he's in Salt Lake City, or Salt Lake at that time. Now that we know, excuse me, now that we know a bit about the first arduous route from 1834, and we know that U.S. dollars were, of course, used in the overland route to an extent. Let's hear from someone I connect to personally in the next chapter. And you're probably going to recognize the name. That brings us to chapter three, the Panama journey. Now we're going to be talking about William Jones Topping. And as, like I said, Topping, he is my fourth great grandfather. He and I obviously share the same surname. He was born in 1817 in the whaling town of Sag Harbor on the eastern end of Long Island. He kept very good records. As we learned, he was a whaler for a majority of his adult life. I wrote about his life in a blog post in 2018 on my website that Sam mentioned. And I want to reiterate one of the points I made in the article. I said, quote, like many of the individuals who decided to make the trek, excuse me, trek, William made it clear that going to California was the opportunity of a lifetime. It was a chance to truly provide for himself and his family, a chance to break the status quo, and a chance to fully control his future. As the U.S. Public Broadcasting Service wrote in a program about the gold rush, they explained how the society William lived in was, quote, increasingly based on wage labor, and, end quote, and, the, uh, and that the, quote, idea that a person could alter his destiny by collecting gold off the ground proved irresistible, end quote. That was, for William, his wage labor situation was the overpopulated whaling industry on Long Island. And the adventure to California to find a new career in gold mining was the irresistible opportunity he so craved, end quote. So the, P the PBS article I mentioned will be in the citations of this presentation of which I can give to anyone on request, please just reach out to Sam and I'd be happy to give it to anyone. But what the PBS article that I mentioned in my 2018 article highlights is that, namely the fact that wage labor was not working out for William as a whaler, and that many around him, the thought of mining your own destiny 
was the opportunity that was impossible to pass up. And so if we go to the slide, we see here he went from New York to Panama. Following Panama, he was, go to, he was to go to San Francisco. And we're gonna reference some of the letters in my personal collection I have of the actual physical document of his letters. And the pros and cons of this route, honestly, it's one of the, if not the fastest route to get to California at this time. But the danger lies in particularly tropical diseases and running out of money. So I'd like to share his portrait with you. I wish I had the portraits of our other travelers. I just happen to have William Jones's portrait. And there he is. This was taken shortly before he left to go to California. So what I'd like to do now is something fun. I'd actually like to, excuse me, I'd like to show you the letter that we're going to be talking about today. And I mentioned this to Sam earlier that I have my document camera. We're going to pull up, pull it up right now in one second. So if you just give me one minute, I'm going to try to get this switched over. I'm going to stop sharing the screen here and I'm going to go over to my document camera. If you just give me one second. There we go, let's see. All right, I think I can see my hand there. So what I'd like to do now, like I said, is show you the actual letter that we're gonna be talking about in just one second. So I'm gonna put my glove on here because this is a almost 180 year old document. I don't want to touch it with my bare hand. There we go. Let's see if I can turn on the light here. Please forgive me one second. There we go, that's a little bit better. So hopefully, I'm hoping you can see the actual document here. Sam, hopefully, would you be able to uh, let me know if you can see this document clearly? Yeah, uh, of course, it, uh, it's a little bit faint. Uh, okay. But yeah, you can definitely uh, see it. Uh, it it's uh, pretty clear. Okay, perfect. I just wanted to make yeah, sure you, it was big on the screen because yeah. my screen says your name. So forgive me, everyone that's watching. I just wanted to make sure you could all see it perfectly or relatively perfect. So we can see here, and I'm going to read the document to you in just a second. I know the, uh, the writing is very hard to read. So I have the transcription, which, by the way, is readily available on jetnumismatics.com. You can read the transcription of this at your leisure. But we see here, Panama, December 15th, 1849. And this is really fascinating to have because obviously of its importance as a family genealog you know, genealogical document. But it's a primary source document just like the ones that we're reading and learning about in the other pages of Gold Rush Literary Exploration edited by Michael Kowalewski. And although, like I said, it's going to be hard to read the writing here, I just wanted to briefly show you what it actually looked like. And forgive me if you're having a little bit of difficulty seeing, but something to note out. He says here, let me see if I can zoom in on you. Huzzah for California. I shall write to you again at the next opportunity. So he goes through this whole document talking about his experience. And I would like to share that briefly with you now. I'm not going to share the, the entire reading because that would be rather long. But I just wanted to make sure you could see here something cool and interesting. And I have full scans of this too, if you'd like to see them. If anyone wants full scans to have 
for themselves, I'd be more than happy to send you them, of course. But before I turn the document camera off, I just wanted to show you what it may have looked like. Now, some of these primary source documents may very well look different, but just look at the penmanship, look at the handwriting, look at the ink, if you can, if you can see it. The ink, the writing, the paper even, it's a very thin, I don't know if you can see it at all, very, very thin piece of paper. And if we flip it over here, you might be able to see the creases where it was folded for well over a hundred years. And you can see the entire paper is completely filled. And something neat, you can see here, his signature at the end. So I'm gonna switch it back over now to the presentation, but I just wanted to include that. I thought it would be interesting for the viewers to see. Not every day that you get the chance to share a 186 year old family document. So I'm gonna switch over. Thank you, Sam. I do hope you enjoyed seeing that piece of history. So let's talk about what he actually writes. We know that in his article, or his letter rather, he was completely nonchalant in his writings. And we learn that, quote, the natives are very friendly. They would lay down in mats in the huts and charge you a dime for lodging and furnish you with hot coffee for half a dime a cup. He further pointed out, quote, dimes and half dimes are their favorite coin and they will take it in preference to a Spanish shilling. I can readily believe that there are more dimes in, circulations, in circulation on the isthmus of, than there is in the city of New York, end quote. So that's what William Jones said in his document. Although he never specified the particular variety of dates on the coins he carried, it's most likely he had different denominations of seeded Liberty coins. So focusing on the actual coins here, we can see and this image is courtesy of Heritage Auctions. This is the Seated Liberty design. And for those of you who collect coins or collect Seated Liberty designs, designed coins, this was the same design on every denomination in that series, starting with a half dime, ending with a dollar. As for the Spanish shilling he mentioned, it's most likely he was referring to the Real. Again, second time we're hearing this or second time we're hearing of the Real. Up until 1857, with the coinage act of 1857, foreign coins such as the Real, or referred to as the Spanish dollar, or Mexican issued currency were considered legal tender in the US. It's possible the Panamanian population preferred American coins due to the fineness and the weight of the silver content over Spanish coinage, and I'm quoting my previous article. According to William Jones, the Panamanian hosts even preferred American gold eagles over other coins and traded them for other American coins, saying they exchange American gold here at what they call 10%. They will give you $11 for an eagle at the rate of eight dimes to the dollar, and that's the best you can do. So we're hearing briefly about the conversion rate again. We're talking about the different coins that were used. And personally, I think it's because of the familiarity of the design. I feel like if you were to receive currency from another country and you were going off of the purity of the metal, it's nice to know where it's coming from. And the design is the same throughout the size and the weight of the coin. Thank you, Sam. And so I want to mention Bayard Taylor, like I said, I found it fascinating in his, in this book, Gold Russia Literary Exploration, we learned from Bayard Taylor that his story and William Jones's story, my ancestor, had almost identical situations. They both came on the same ship. And this is referencing his book, excuse me, his book, Bayard Taylor's book, El Dorado. This is on page 66 of Kowalewski's compilation, Gold Russia Literary Exploration. Page 66, Bayard Taylor talks about the Falcon heading to Panama. He had to pass through Chagres. He had to go to Cruces. I hope I'm pronouncing that right. He talks about the wonders of the gold rush, the success stories returning through Panama back to the U.S. 
and then talks about hotels where Americans stayed at passing through. So quickly, I wanna go through this, talk about Mr. Dornan's South America route, and then hopefully discuss with you, the viewers, what we learned here. So Bayard Taylor talks about how he was on the ship called Falcon. He learned, we learned, quote, I left the Falcon at daybreak on the ship Falcon. We rounded off the high bluff on which the castle stands, found beyond it a little shallow bay on the Easter side of which on a low ground stands the cane huts of Chagres, end quote. And if we look at the entire WJ Topping letter of which the transcription, like I said, is readily available, we learn that WJ Topping took the Falcon, the same boat, same ship, and reached the Eastern side of Panama in 1849. And if you'd like to read more about that, I recommend you check out, of course, the compilation book that I keep referencing. This is page 66. And then if you'd like to learn more about William Jones, I'd be more than happy to share it with you. Quickly, I want to give a shout out to Dr. Jesse Kraft, who is now part of the American Numismatic Society, who, by the way, is giving a Money Talks presentation on the 17th. Be sure to register for that. I wanted to give him a well-deserved shout out because we talked about the 12 and a half cents in chapter one. He talks about the circulation of foreign coinage in particular, giving a breakdown of conversion rate between Spanish coins and US coins, the real. He confirms in his 2019 dissertation that the one that we're talking about in chapter one and here was indeed 12 and a half cents US for each Spanish, or in Mr. Dana's case, I suppose, Mexican real. So we know about some of the coins used from various countries. We know, heard briefly about the overland journey. We know a lot about numismatics in Panama, thanks to William Jones. But let's talk quickly about George D. Dornan. And this is in his book, 30 Years Ago. He's talking about dollars on board. And if we go quickly to page 60, he says, quote, I provided myself with an arsenal consisted of a double-barreled gun cost $8, with rifled and smoothbore, an Allen's revolver of pepper box pattern, and a Bowie knife of formidable dimensions, end quote. So we see the fleeting references to US dollars again, even on a ship bound for California, crossing through international waters, yet the primary choice of currency was the US dollar. It's not surprising because he very well could have used and purchased these items off the ship, not necessarily on board, because he doesn't specify. But it makes it interesting in the next quote, talking about ditching the guns when he was in California, saying, quote, the revolver was thrown away soon after my arrival in California as being more dangerous to the shooter than the shot at, and only provided me with some ready money when I was hard up a few days after I landed, finding sale at $35, end quote. So if we dissect and try to investigate the backstory behind this quote, we realize that even though Dornan was familiarized and using US dollars in either America before his trip or on board. We learned that the unit of currency in California was now the dollar at least. And how interesting this is just 15 years after what Mr. Richard Henry Dana Jr. in 1834 used both reals and dollars. So why is this important? We know the who, the what, the when, the where, and the why particularly in the context of numismatics. We know the big five W questions, but what is my opinion on why our numismatic records are so sparse, sparse rather, on the overland route compared to our seafaring route? So let me just summarize. We learn before the gold rush, reals and dollars. We learn overland, Salt Lake City area, modern day Salt Lake City area, US dollars. We learn on the seafaring routes that it was both reals and dollars. So we're seeing this, this theme where those are the two primary currencies used by the travelers. That's what we're focusing on today, the currencies used by the travelers. And we learn from William Jones that the currency they preferred, at least in his source document, his reference is what he's talking about that they preferred American coins over Spanish coins. 
Again, what is my opinion on why our numismatic records are so sparse on the overland routes? I think it comes down to what's important. Thank you, Sam. I'm just finishing up now. I think it comes down to what is important for our travelers to include in their journals or diaries. On overland routes, at least in terms of the, the, the records I'm citing from here, Gold Rush, the recurring theme from the stories there is that the exciting dangers they faced along the way had been more important than stories talking about using currencies and coins. So being chased by a bear was more important to write about than the fact that you had a silver dollar in your pocket and you used it to buy some good or service. It's simply, my estimation is it simply wasn't important enough, at least from what I've read, to include, if you have to scare off mountain lions on your journey, to include that in your, in your journal. But for our seafaring routes, why is that different? I think it has to do with how monotonous the travel actually was. Whereas the overland travelers had to hide, had to, excuse me, had to ride their horses or adventure on foot, constantly aware and threatened by whatever natural external forces, dangerous flora or fauna, however, may threaten them, the seafaring travelers kept to their same tasks. If we go back to Dornan in chapter four on page 62 of the, of the uh, compilation book edited by Kowalewski, we read, quote, we soon ran into warmer latitude, going further, adding, reading, writing, the inevitable card playing, lounging about the decks in fair weather, cleaning and repairing guns and pistols occupied the time, end quote. So regardless of numismatics, we learn that it's rather monotonous. And so in my opinion, from the writings that we read, both from William Jones and Dornan in this case, going on the ship, your, your fun activity for the day was spending money on buying a cigar or what have you. And that is what you included in your journal or your letters going home. So in summary, the main currencies of the travelers to the American gold rush by American travelers, regardless of the route, were reals, either from Spain or Mexico, and US dollars. And with that, ladies and gentlemen, I hope you learned something interesting today from this very short take on what a journey of numismatics that spanned over 15 years over the course of the entire gold rush. And like I said in the beginning, we never stop learning about events in the past, especially when you have this thick of a book of primary sources talking about those experiences. We learned from Dana Jr. before the gold rush. We learned about Carr on the overland route very briefly. And we went to my fourth great grandfather. We read from his letter that I am fortunate to have in my possession. And we looked through the route of, Pan of Panama through the other perspective of Mr. Taylor, Bayard Taylor, and then to our final traveler, Mr. Dornan, who went all the way around to South America. Again, I highly recommend everyone reads Gold Rush, a literary exploration edited by Michael Kowaleski. It's an absolutely fantastic resource. And again, ladies and gentlemen, I hope you learned something from this today. And I'd be happy to take any questions or comments you might have right now. And this is my work cited. Like I said, if you'd like that, just let Sam know and I'd be happy to send it to you. Well, Jack, thank you very, very much. Greatly appreciated. Uh, folks, I'm about to uh, launch a uh, survey right now. Please, before you leave the room, we would greatly appreciate your uh, frank responses uh, to these uh, questions. Of course, if you need to elaborate on one of your answers or have additional comments, please email them to Brianna Victor at seminars at money.org. Again, that's seminars at money.org if you uh, need to elaborate on uh, one of your answers uh, for the survey. Uh, definitely want to thank Jackie Topping for his presentation. Uh, great job on the uh, the primary sources, man. Phenomenal. Thank you, thank you. I, I, I apologize for the uh, for the bit of the technical difficulty um, involved with the 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 camera arm, and then you can see that the green screen is kind of cutting into here. I don't know what happened, but I do appreciate everyone's flexibility and and patience. No, of course, no, that was fine. Um, not not a problem at all. It's just a uh, it's great when you can see that, and uh, I hope, um, I mean, the historical connection that we have with coins, that to me is everything. I mean, maybe I'm biased as a former world history teacher, but uh, 
honestly, yeah, it, it, it just uh, it uh, warms the heart to see someone, uh, you know, pulling out real primary sources that they are connected to. That's just incredible. Thank you. Yes. So um, we didn't really have a ton of uh, questions come in. Um, uh, we definitely have uh, some thank yous and shout outs. Uh, so that's kind of cool. Uh, I like seeing that. Um, Thank yeah. you to everyone who watched. I really do appreciate it. I really, it, it means a lot to me that, yeah. you, that you've attended and that you, you listened to not only a piece of my family history, but family history of our other travelers who may or may not be talked about very much in everyday life. So it's, it's really nice way to, to bring them back to life in a sense, hearing from their words. Um, and that's, that's what I wanted to highlight, especially through the lens of numismatics today. Nice. Well, maybe if you, uh, you said you might, uh, you were thinking of coming out here for summer seminar, so maybe at some point uh, it'll inspire you when you're uh, in the Pikes Peak area to do something on the 1859 Gold Rush. Yes, sir. I would absolutely love to do that. Nice. Yeah, that's a uh, big fun out here. I always love uh, whenever I have a chance uh, myself to go on the other side of Pikes Peak, on the other side of where the ANA headquarters is, uh, towards uh, an area they call uh, Buena Vista or uh, Woodland Park even. And, nice. Uh, that's uh, where it's nice to find uh, – some uh, little streams and uh, well, some some places you can find uh, the Ar the uh, headwaters of the Arkansas River, and that's a fun place to go prospecting out here. So, I would uh, love to do that. I've never been. Yeah, it, it it's a lot of fun. Uh, it's always more fun when you find uh, yellow metal. Uh, I, I bet. I bet. Tough to find. They're not easy, and when you find them, they're usually real tiny. Yeah, I bet. <laughs> yep. So. Uh, Let's see if we had uh, any other uh, questions come through. No, but um, that uh, that one person that uh, mentioned uh, Kellogg uh, and their connection, uh, they said you definitely inspired me to do more with uh, uh, JGK's history. So yes, JGK. please, I would absolutely love to hear about that too. Um, forgive me, I don't know the name of the person to commenting, but I would love to abs I would absolutely love to read more about about your ancestor's life. Absolutely fascinating. Nice. Yeah, I, encourage, I encourage you to 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 do some family research or or com compile some of your oh, some of the information so that you have. This person uh, is asking how they can uh, reach you. Uh, I'm not sure if you wanted to share contact info. I usually don't sure. like to give out uh, our presenters' contact info for fear of stalkers. You know. And, Thank uh, you. Yeah. Uh, I mean, the you best do a good way job presenting, you know, you're going to get a ton of people. You know, clamoring. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. the best way um, is Twitter. At Jet Numismatics, J E T N U M I S M A T I C S, <laughs> Numismatics, uh, Jet Numismatics. Or if you have any questions or comments, please feel free to, to let Sam or, or Brianna know and they, they can send it my way. Sure. Yeah. The, uh, if not, you could always email us seminars at money.org or education at money.org. It'll yep. reach uh, one of us. Um, it's interesting too because some of the people uh, participating in the chat uh, are YNs and uh, it's always nice to see a former YN give a talk for, uh, on behalf yes, of Yes, I encourage, yes. If you're a YN watching right now, stick with it. Yep. Stick with it. You will, you will learn so much from, from learning about numismatics. And, and you, when you grow up, you will learn more about how numismatics ties into other things. And it, it really is a nice base knowledge to have as you interact with other things. So there's uh, one other uh, question that came just came in, and I believe this is from a YN, so I know uh, they can uh, prove uh, that when they request YN dollars, this kid's all right now. <laughs> so it says, uh, what will you do when you graduate from college? Will you stay uh, with numismatics or stay involved in numismatics? That's a good question. Um, to be honest with you, uh, I don't know. <laughs> I'll be honest, I did not. Uh, from about age 20. If you mean, do you mean professionally or do you mean just as, as doing? Uh, oh, that's a good question. Well. Yeah, they didn't uh, uh, specify, but. Um, uh, obviously, I, I, well, not obviously, but hopefully, obviously, I want to stick with always learning. Like I said, always keep learning, especially numismatics. You can always learn more. I want to be doing research for my own sake, just to learn more forever. That's my goal. Um, but I'm not sure if you mean professionally. I that, I don't have the answer. Uh, professionally, to that. yeah. Uh, uh, I, I don't honestly. I don't have. The, I appreciate that. I don't have the answers to that. Gotcha. Yeah, that's a tough. Not one. yet. <laughs> it's one of those things. Uh, you can't turn off that collector's eye. I mean, I. Oh right, exactly. Yep. 
too much. I mean, from age 20 to 30, but uh, in between there, I worked as an office manager and it was hard not to go through rolls of brand new quarters that were coming in <laughs> to look for silver. I mean, right, right. Yeah, of course, of course, of course. All right. So um, there are a couple of people that are just finishing up our uh, survey. So again, thanks uh, to those of you uh, that are doing that. Please, again, make sure you uh, fill out that survey uh, before exiting the room. Um, again, uh, Jack, if anyone, uh, or if there are any late questions uh, that come in, I'll, uh, forward them uh, to you for sure. Absolutely. Uh, thank you. Really want to thank you again, Jack. Phenomenal of course. Uh, we do have a certificate of appreciation. Thank uh, you. We send it to you. Uh, not sure exactly when, because it's tough for us to get into the office. Of days. course. I understand. But um, it'll be coming soon. Um, folks, I uh, just wanted to thank you uh, one last time for joining us for this presentation this evening. Uh, please join us for our next presentation before the Coinage Act of 1857, How Americans Spent Their Foreign Money by Dr. Jesse Kraft of the ANS. Uh, this is going on on Monday, August 17th at, uh, I believe it'll be 4.30 p.m. Eastern, 2.30 p.m. Mountain Time here. Um, Dr. Kraft, uh, it, this should be a phenomenal presentation. Uh, he was supposed to be part of the uh, talks uh, that the EAC conference had. Uh, that was going on. So really honored that we uh, have Dr. Kraft for this one. Um, and of course, I know Jag, you had a shout out to Jesse in there. As Absolutely. Well. Yes. Dr. Kraft's, uh, that's another thing. Definitely read that. If you, if you have time, read what he wrote. Well, I don't want to, I don't want to speak for his presentation, but <laughs> watch his presentation. I hopefully will be there. I can't wait to hear it. Awesome. All right, everyone. Again, I uh, just want to remind you that if you want to register for the next presentation or upcoming uh, presentations, please visit our website, money.org. Uh, right on the home screen, there's a, a slider going across. Just click on the big green and orange and white one that says eLearning Academy, um, and you'll uh, be able to access uh, upcoming presentations to register for them and recorded ones that we've already done. Uh, this one that Jack just did will probably be archived uh, probably within the next week or two. So uh, our video team's pretty busy these days. Uh, so hopefully they'll get on that pretty soon again. Thanks, Jack. Thank, Thank you. you. Our uh, members and everyone else who came uh, for the presentation tonight. Certainly appreciate it. And I uh, hope to see you on Monday uh, early evening or afternoon, depending on your time zone. Thank you much, everyone. Have a good evening.